Hey everyone, it's Candace Dickens, your dope black therapist. And today you just got me. That has to be enough. So um, I want to talk about an important topic. You know, medical trauma is devastating. If you or someone you know has been in an accident that was no fault of their own, or if it if they were at fault, it devastates you because something happens to the body that they can't quickly recover from. And if the body does recover slowly, the mind might still be in the experience. So a medical trauma doesn't have to always just be being an accident. It could be having cancer, diabetes, hypertension. All these things make you feel out of control. They make you feel vulnerable. I have so many family members and friends and clients who said the worst thing that ever happened to me is that I've got diabetes. And I used to think about things such as playing golf and what I want to do with my life. And now I'm just thinking about what's my sugar level? You know, did I eat enough? Is my insulin level good, right? For cancer, it's a silent killer because people will say, I didn't feel anything. I'm not in pain. I'm actually just in a marathon. I'm in the best shape of my life. And it's traumatic because of the fact that you have no sense of it. It's a trauma and every trauma creates that feeling of vulnerability and that feeling of being out of control and takes us by surprise. And every trauma arrives without you asking for it, without inviting it. So when there are people who take medication or they have a disorder such as a thyroid disorder and they're losing weight or they're gaining weight because maybe they have lupus and they're taking medic hormones like steroids and it's giving them that round look, right? And they'll say, wow, this is traumatic because on one level, I'm doing the things that save my life. But on another level, I, can't, I don't recognize myself anymore. And I'm not able to do the things I used to do because the medication has made me have aches in my legs or I get fatigued really easily or I don't have the strength I used to have. And it feels like a body betrayal, right? And, and here's the thing. Think about a close relationship. What happens with most of you people, honestly? When someone betrays you, what do you do? I just made a hint. Cut them off. But the thing about the body betrayal is doing something that you didn't want it to do or didn't ask for it to do. And sometimes we get angry with the body and you can't cut the body off, or can you? Some of us cut the body off by drinking too much, eating too much, or not really being in touch with us. We don't look at ourselves in the mirror. We disconnect because connecting it to it brings us sadness. It reminds us of the trauma and it reminds us that something's happening that I have no control of. So we try to control the things that we can control. Like I can control what I put in my mouth all day long. I can control what I drink all day long. I control if I get high or not get high. I can control who even who I have sex with if it's my choice all day long. But you can't control if you have MS. And you can't control if you have symptoms of MS. You can take the medication and the medication helps put it into control. Right? But you can't control something happening with the body that you didn't ask for, including a miscarriage. There are so many couples who been infertile couples and they can't control when they have a child when they conceive. No matter how many injections they take, no matter how many procedures they can't control them, they can't make the body do what's on command. If you're someone who is an athlete, or someone who's a bodybuilder, you know what how the body be able to do what you want it to do, to make that body jump, to make that body, body soar. But imagine if you lose control, you can't make that body get pregnant. Or you can't make the body get your partner pregnant because you're having erectile dysfunction, because you work in a factory or you work someplace where um, you got injured and didn't realize you were injured. Because there are a lot of people who are electrical engineers or chemical engineers who work with chemicals and they didn't realize that the chemical impact on their body or they worked in factories. And they didn't realize the heat and the combustion from where they worked at, where they made a living for their family would eventually stop them from growing their family. And then there's that anger that comes in, right? When you have a medical trauma, that anger. And usually when we get angry, anger is the one emotion that lets us know that something has happened to us, that something's done something to us. But imagine if that something is you, that your cells have changed on their own, or you put yourself in a scenario that you didn't know was going to happen. A medical trauma is, hey, I get this new apartment, and it's got lead in the paint, and I have no idea. All I know is, wow, my babies and I got this new apartment. We love it. It's rent free, or it's just state of the art. It's gorgeous. And then your baby has problems with speech, and you can't figure out what that's about. Well, imagine you live in Flint, right? And the water's contaminated. 
and you have aches and pains and they never go away. Or imagine you're, you're on the call at 9-11 and you're a fireman or a paramedic and you're going in there trained to do what you're supposed to do. You run into a building to save people and then fast forward nine months later, you got a cough that you can't get rid of. Your hair is shedding. That you've inhaled all the carcinogens that were related to the building collapsing. Medical trauma is devastating because it changes your trajectory in life, it shortens it or makes it very different from what you expected. And those are the big traumas, right? But what about the, the traumas that people think are small traumas? Like when women excessively have menstrual, have sex and bleed because they have heavy menstrual cycles and they do one pad after another pad and there's that shame of people seeing it and not knowing that their body's gonna allow me to go to a concert, right? Or the trauma of, you know, being a teenager and having an erection at the wrong time, the quote, air quotes, right? Because you can be frightened and have an erection or be aroused and have an erection at a movie theater. And it's traumatic because it's a sexual trauma because it involves the sexual organs. Just like a miscarriage is a sexual trauma because it involves the, the organs. The one thing that separates a sexual trauma from a medical trauma, people always think you know, sexual trauma is just sexual abuse, <laughs> is anything that involves the sexual organs. So I went to a class, a somatic experiencing class, and I had this amazing teacher, Ifu. If she's watching this, I love you, you changed my life. And one of the things she talked about was sexual trauma can be anything from a mess carriage to you getting, being a boy, um, riding on a bike, and you have a horrible fall, and one of your testes goes in. So sexual trauma involves the genitals, or you get kicked in a fight, and you're, you're afraid now that if I get kicked, that something's bad's gonna happen to me, and I've got pain every time I urinate. It's a sexual trauma. For men who have cancer in the scrotum or in the genital areas, it's a sexual trauma because something has happened to you that's difficult. But going back to what I said earlier, I went to this amazing training on somatic experience, and one of the things she had talked about was women don't realize that women who are on bed rest are having sexual traumas that have resonated with me. Because when I was pregnant with my twins, right, and I'm, and I'm pausing, so I just want you to notice how my body has shifted, right, from smiling to just taking a moment. When I was pregnant with my twins, and my chest getting tight, and I can feel that. And this is the thing for anyone who's a trauma survivor and a trauma thriver, is that trauma brings you right back into that situation. So even though my twins are 18 and my last twin is leaving whoop, 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 today, so this is Zeta Five Data, pretty girl, will be an empty nester. So even though my twins are 18 years old and one got dropped off in college and one leaves today, when I think about the trauma of what happened to me 18 years ago, my heart beats really fast and my throat gets tight, right? And that's the trauma response, right? That's the polyvagal response that lets my body know that something's happening that makes me anxious or there's something that's happening that was dangerous for me or that is dangerous because the brain has no sense of time. It can't tell if it was or is. It thinks it's the same thing. That what happened then is happening now. So as I'm reliving, it's like I'm watching a movie. I'm reliving it, I'm retelling it. So I'm going back to 18 years ago. And 18 years ago, I had this amazing friend who's still an amazing friend, Marlo Lemon. We had made a plan to go um, to, we were both pregnant at the same time. We made a plan to go to Red Lobster to have um, some crabs and celebrate our pregnancy because it wasn't easy getting pregnant. And um, I said, hey, you know, I had my last sonogram and she was having twins as well. And my last sonogram, they didn't see my, uh, my girl twins. I got to go in for five minutes. I'll be in and out. And then I'll meet you at the restaurant. She was like, great. So I go in there, you know, hey, happy to see the babies. And um, they said, well, you know, Candace, what's going to happen next is we just want you to wait for the doctor and then you'll be going. You can do whatever you want to do. And I hugged everybody because I was so excited. You know, when you go to the sign, they give you little pictures. And when you have twins, you take, you go for more visits than a single. So we go every month to make sure that everything's progressing because we're at high risk. So as I'm sitting there waiting, the doctor, the, um, the nurse comes in and says, hey, the doctor wants to see you. And I said, well, she's not coming in? She said, mm -mm. she wants to see you in the in her office. So that's weird. Okay. So I go in there and um, this is a doctor I didn't know because my doctor wasn't there. She was in surgery. So I'm sitting down and I'm by myself, I guess, and I'm thinking I got to hurry up and go because I'm going to get some crabs. And um, you know, you're not supposed to be eating crabs when you're pregnant, I'm just saying. But um, I sit down 
And she says, Miss Dickens, you're actually in labor. And I said, what? She said, well, the good news is that, that even though you're in labor, the baby's hearts are good. The bad news is that when we scan you downward, your cervix is open. I was like, cervix is open. She said, you're actually in labor. Do you have any feelings? Mm -mm. I feel like myself. And I said, so what does this mean? Um, I'm in labor. I said, I, I'm only, I think it was like four and a half months pregnant. She said, um, we, we will either deliver those babies today. And she said, and let me tell you that at four and a half months, twins are very small. So if this was a baby who was a singleton, the risk of survival would be greater. My heart is beating fast again. I'm just taking a breath because whenever you tell a story, there's a trauma story. Go slowly into it because I'm visualizing in my head, even though I'm in front of the screen talking to all of your amazing people, I can see myself being in back in that room listening to her. And she said, even though you have four and a half months, if this is a singleton, we can save them. But because you are um, having twins, the risk of survival is, is not good. So I remember, she said, well, we got to call the hospital, see if we can get your room. So sit right here. So she left. And all I remember is, this is not good. I was in shock. And I remember calling my husband and not being able to reach him. Then I called my mom. You know, everybody has a mama on a speed dial or you got somebody close to you on a speed dial. And we do that because that's part of the core regulation, right? I was in my mother's stomach. We're connected to the umbilical cord. I come out. My mother's a hugger and a rocker. I'm connected. And even as a grown woman, I'm still connected. So the brain knows connection. So when I get anxious or something big happens, good or bad, I'll call my mom, call my mom. She's like, take a breath. So I'm like, right? I'm, my, I'm activated, right? It's that whole fight flight response. I'm activated. I'm breathing fast, talking fast, just like I'm doing now. Because when we're activated, right, the brain takes the information in and it says, hey, something's happening. The polyvagal nerves, the top of your head sends a signal to the rest of the body. It stimulates the adrenal gland, some of the adrenaline. And that says, get the body ready because you need adrenaline to fight, to fight, to run, or to deal with something. And adrenaline speeds up the brain to think faster. And I'm going think, oh my God, I can't be having a baby. I'm not going to have contractions. And I was panicking. And she had to calm me down. She said, no, just take a breath. Getting yourself all worked up is not going to happen. If you know my mama, that sounds like my mama. She was like, you know, getting yourself all worked up is not going to help. I notice my hands are up, right? I'm in the, I'm in the experience. So now I'm going to put my hands down to remind myself that I'm outside. And when people are telling anything that's traumatic, what we'll say is ground yourself. I'm in my beautiful garden with my Zeta Phi Beta 1920 shirt. I'm with you. I'm not in the hospital at JBMC. I'm with you. Because this experience is not just about talking to you about trauma. It's about demonstrating what trauma looks like. Right, and how to get through it so that you don't have to live in it, especially when you're going back to visit it to share it with people so they learn what's happened to you. That's no longer happening to you, but what happened to you, ED, past tense. So I went from that office immediately to the emergency room, immediately to um, immediately to a, um, a crisis room. And I remember um, in the emergency room, and I remember... Um, Finally, we had to reach my, my, my husband and my mom had called my husband and called my brothers and they, they were finding out what was happening. And my family was out of town. I live in Maryland. They were out of town. And I remember my husband coming a couple hours later and, um, and then my in-laws came. And I remember being upside down because they had to take pressure off of my cervix. And I, and I remember um, just breathing because I'm a clinician, right? I'm not just a clinician. I'm a trauma clinician. I'm not a clinician, I'm a dope black therapist clinician. I've been trained in this. And I remember breathing and breathing. And I remember saying, we've got to, we've got to um, find a vein because we have to put uh, magnesium in you. And I remember saying, what is that? What's going on? And saying yes to everything, right? And I remember putting it in into my veins and magnesium, for those of you who don't know, stops the contractions because I didn't realize I was having all these contractions and then being, when you're tense, it makes the body tight. And remember that the uterus is a muscle. So if my arm is relaxed, I make it tense, it's gonna get tense. So if you're tense, stressed out, your body's gonna have that reaction because the body is designed for survival. And when we're in survival mode, it's not, oh, girl, it's no, I gotta get things done. I may have to, you know, do some things. 
I got to look around. I've got to be alert, right? Just like any animal. I've got to make sure that no one's coming at me, that I can survive any situation. By being in survival mode and having a cascade of emotions come through my body, cortisol being released because I was stressed, adrenaline, right? My breathing became shallow. And even though I'm a clinician and I kept saying, no, look at the clock, look at number 12, breathe, you're going to count the numbers from 12. Because I knew enough that if I, if I mindfulness and I breathe, now went from 12 to number one to number two, then I can just, I can drop a hot thought. And a hot thought was, my babies aren't going to make it. My babies aren't going to make it. And I wanted them to make it. And I felt so powerless because I'm a type A person. I like things in order. And if you're like me, put it in the chat. I like things in order. I like knowing what's going on. And I think that's what makes clinicians, clinicians, and medical providers, providers. We like things in order and we like solving. And this is the one time, this is the thing about medical trauma, right? And sexual trauma. It makes you feel powerless. You can't solve it. You can't fix it. Now, you can improve the situation, but you can't solve it. You can't make it better. And I remember a nurse coming in and saying, you know, just pray. And I was like, I want to pray. She said, no, you got to pray. This is when you got to pray because, you know, you got to let God's will be done. And I'm thinking, no, if I let control to God, I may not have a baby. I may not. Oh, no. Right. Because part of the grief cycle, the trauma cycle is that feeling of disbelief. And that feeling of, I've got to do something. Right. That fight response. I've got to do something to make this better. So I was breathing and meditating constantly. And you know, my husband got there and he was like, well, she's responding really well, but What's in her her arm is temporary because you can see that's going to blow out because I have really small things that that roll quite a bit. And then what they said to him is, we need to put something in her neck. And because she's heavily medicated, she really can't make decisions um, for herself. So here's another layer where I'm losing control because I was so medicated with the uh, medication that really I was sort of out of it. I was in it, but I was out of it quite a bit, and I was I'm upside down as well. And I remember coming over and he said, do you want this? They want to put a, a catheter in you and they want to put a line in your neck. And I said, whatever you think is best, right? And, and we were married for maybe two years, but I'm trusting this man. And they come in, they said, because you're pregnant, we can't numb you. We've got to go through your neck and put a line in your biggest um, vein in your neck. And he was in the room and I'm looking at him and um, they said, but first we'll do the catheter. And he was giving them permission because I was out of it. So they went to the husband for permission. So another layer of I'm losing control. Right? Similar to a medical trauma for a lot of people who go into comas, whether it's a medical induced coma or an accident induced coma or medication induced coma. It's traumatic when you lose time. And when you wake up, people are happy to see you. But it's frightening not knowing what happened to you. And people who have that kind of medical trauma search for that gap because people don't like to have gaps in memories. They don't like the fact that people saw them and they can't remember what they saw. They weren't present. And there's something frightening about having that level of control. But going back to my story, so he had to give permission. I'm watching him. So it was, it was disconnected because I'm watching him giving them permission to do things to me that I couldn't say yes or no to. But I, I really, we both, knew, we both knew that we wanted these twins, right? He's coming in holding our two-year-old son, Anthony. And I wanted him to have siblings. So they're doing the catheter and come in. And my mother-in-law comes in, um, Paulette, she's crying and falling out and just loving on me. And then they came in to do the procedure and she walks out because she can't see it. And he's standing there and they're holding out two year old. He stands there and they're putting this, this line in my neck without anesthesia that we're normally done with anesthesia because it's so painful. And I'm screaming and he's there and they ask him, do you want us to stop? And he says, no. And there's another layer of control because that was my first of many procedures. I was there for five months, four months, excuse me. I went in four and a half months pregnant. I left at close to nine months pregnant. And for those those months that I was hospitalized, I couldn't sit up, couldn't get over the bathroom on my own. Everything was done in that bed. I had my baby shower in that bed and it was a medical trauma. And the day that I went home, my mom flew in, went home, caught a cold somehow threw up my food and went right back to the hospital the next day. And I was in labor again. And this time they said, no, we can't stop it because you're so far along. Um, and then there's a medical trauma after that where my body retained fluid. So I had to stay in an extra day. And then a, a week later, I'm home with the babies. And what happens, my, my um, intestines collapse. 
because while I was on, um, while I was in the hospital, I was throwing up every day. I would eat and throw up, eat and throw up. And we didn't realize what it was doing to my intestines, the baby's weight, laying in the bed that way. So it was trauma after trauma after trauma. And the one thing that helped me get through was doing the breathing, was finding something. And later on, I, I learned what it's called clinically, finding a place to put my thoughts whether I'm looking around my, my environment, little brain spotting, finding something where my eyes can just rest. And I would take a breath. And I didn't realize I was gaze spotting, which is a brain spotting technique. So for those of you who aren't familiar with gaze spotting, look under brain spotting. Um, a wonderful technique that allows you to reprocess, but also allows you to disconnect from the trauma that you're experiencing and giving you some space so you can breathe. And what else helped me was just doing soft touches. Right? Having a medical trauma and a sexual trauma is very difficult. And I just want to say, especially that sexual trauma piece, sexual trauma is often generational. So women who have um, go to menopause early have daughters who go to menopause early. Women who have heavy bleeding have daughters who have heavy bleeding. Women who have fibroids have daughters who have fibroids. Women who have infertility often have daughters who have infertility. Many women who have um, cancer of the, of the sexual organs, sometimes, not always, have children who have cancer. It's hereditary, right? And it can be disorganized. And it's, it's frightening. And that's the thing that all these traumas have in common is that they create this feeling of shock and this feeling of numbness and disbelief that something is happening to you that you never want to happen. And what I found is what, that both traumas is that when I meet some, someone who's at trauma, I'll say, no, just hold on. Or let somebody hold on to you. Put your feet on the ground. Or let somebody hold you so they can hold your weight. And give yourself permission to cry. Or just with feet on the ground, give yourself permission to rock. Backwards and forwards. Feeling the sun on my face. Feeling the warmth of the sun. Taking a breath in. And breathing could look like this. Breathe in, go up the mountain. Coming down real slow. So many people who have trauma have been taught to breathe like this. No, if you're having a panic attack, but I'll say to people, panic attacks, open chest, because when you're having a panic attack or an anxiety attack, that the adrenaline is hitting your lungs and your heart and making your lungs that are normally like this, make some constraint and get tight. And what we want to do is breathe life back into you because if your lungs open back up, the heart slows it down. And the heart is directed to the brain right through the aorta. And if the heart slows down, the brain thinks, oh, it must be over. Stop producing all these hormones. Stop putting that polyvagal nerve down and stop submitting, transmitting that neurotransmitter and let the body be at rest again, right? It goes back to a place with polyvagal connection. But the dorsal vagal comes back online and we're at rest and ease and we can go back to being connected. So what I'll tell people is take breath in, say go up the mountain, breathe up and breathe out slow. However, if you're having a panic attack, I'll say make the breathing big so it's making an O, breathe up, <gasps> breathe out. Breathe up. Now it's just like clapping thunder, right? Because it's giving me a headache. Because the tighter you are, the more you want to push the air into the lungs to relax the body. So the body has a sense of relaxation and you're reoxygenating the brain because a relaxed body is not tense. So even though the situation has changed, you've changed. So when me being pregnant, all I could do was breathe and shift my attention to something else. The situation didn't go away. I knew it was upside down. I knew I had lines in my neck. But what happened is I was able to have a sense of control. And if I have people who have paralysis, I'll say, I know that the worst thing is that you can no longer walk again. But I want you to notice if you can move your nose. I want to move more than I know, but I want you to have an appreciation for the things that you can do. Give yourself an opportunity to notice the things that you can do. They give you a sense of power. If you're having a miscarriage, to recognize that being something happening in your uterus or if something's happening if, as a male, if you're having difficulty um, with your sperm count, recognize there's something happening internal. And I'm really big internal healing. I want you just, just to connect with a part of you that has healing. Go inward if you can, 
and with, you connect with your higher power or you connect with your healing self. And put hands here, one on the chest, one on the heart, or one on the chest, and then now this is a grounding technique, right? Now I want you just to connect to the party that's healed, that has healing power. And if you want to put a spiritual um, or a gem in your hand or a stone, would you connect to that part and connect to the, to the party you my hand is here. Connect to the party that has life. A room has life. And give yourself permission to recognize that any party you can be restored. There's diabetes that can be restored. Right? Because stress is one of the things that makes diabetes go up. And cancer is one of the things that the body can heal from. But a tense body creates dis-ease. And dis-ease creates disease. So one of the things I want you to do is really mind-body connection and giving yourself an opportunity to really take good care of yourself. Because you're going to hold this way, hold this way. You see any of the reading techniques I talk, or you're noticing why I'm talking really fast. And I'm walking really fast. And I'm moving really fast. So I'm going to use some mindfulness techniques. And I'm going to talk slow because where your body goes, your emotion goes. Where your emotions go, your energy goes. And if your energy is slower and more intentional, the body can go to a place of calm and rest. If I'm tapping or tapping, I'm telling my nervous system, I need you to calm down. Because this connects to the back of your brain where the emotions are at. I need you to calm down. Because we need that logical part, that part that's able to think about what we're thinking. We need that logical part to take over so we can process this and make a game plan so we can live and be strong and plan on how we can take good care of ourselves. But if my emotional brain is online, that, point, that prefrontal lobe part, that things what you're thinking, is offline. So I'm telling my body by tapping, by tapping, by tapping, that I need all of me to come online. I hope this was helpful. Healing is possible, whether it's medical trauma or sexual trauma. Healing is possible. Hands on the chest. Right. Just want you to connect with that. If this, if you're feeling activated by any of the things we rock, your feet on the ground, look at your toes, smile. Even though you may feel like you have nothing to smile about. When you smile, the brain signals calmness, and the body thinks the trauma is over. And notice how you feel just by watching me walk, rock back and forth. Just notice for a second how it feels to see me outdoors in nature, just rocking. Notice how that lands on your nervous system. Because when we have trauma, it dysregulates and disrupts and disorganizes the nervous system. And all these techniques I've talked about, opening my hands up wider, are ways of connecting you to that nervous system. If you feel that you need a provider, I'm going to give you a place where you can go to. I have a provider directory called coloroftraumaandhealing.com. That's color traumaandhealing.com. On the directory is a listing of BIPOC providers, but I also have a listing of trauma resource coping cards where they have at least 31 of the techniques that I've talked about today. And you can get them for free. Just go there, order the, the cards, and I personally mail them out to you. Have an amazing day. Be safe. Heal yourself and love on yourself. Take care.